Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone all over the world. Uh, we are starting first real uh, session at the uh, IWRA uh, Groundwater Conference dedicated. This session is dedicated to technology and uh, link of uh, technology with uh, uh, groundwater resilience. Actually, this topic has two sessions and one is going to be today and the other tomorrow. Uh, my name is uh, Neno and uh, together with uh, Enrique, uh, I'm going to moderate this uh, great session because we have uh, uh, great speakers and I have only five minutes to uh, introduce uh, speakers, to introduce a session and uh, to introduce a topic. And, but I already did the most important thing as uh, that's to welcome you. So uh, briefly <clears throat> about uh, a session, about a topic, uh, it's a link uh, uh, between technology and groundwater. This link is uh, already uh, 4,000 years old. Remember just the Kanats in Iran or, or Yemen uh, uh, 2,000 years ago and then uh, through the ages, technology was progressing, and especially with uh, uh, ICT, there are a lot of contribution to uh, tools uh, to assist in uh, monitoring, in uh, processing, and uh, management of groundwater. So we will have uh, today uh, very <clears throat> interesting presentations. Uh, 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 first, we will. We'll, uh, kick off with uh, our keynote, uh, Basant, and then we will have Lou and uh, Raphael <clears throat> and Crystal and Claudia and Patrick. So, but uh, first, before we, we start with that, I need to uh, read just a few uh, housekeeping instructions. So, firstly, how to use Zoom. We invite you to submit your questions in English via the Q&A button and uh, Enrique is going to look at there and uh, answer your question or uh, put it uh, for the oral uh, reply. You can find this button at the bottom of the, your screen and uh, 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 as we have a huge audience at this moment more than 200 I see, uh, if we don't have time to answer all the questions we receive over, over the next 90 minutes. Uh, we will aim to collect written responses from presenters to place on the conference website following this event. Please note that chat box is disabled during the session. However, we ask you to keep an eye uh, for any useful messages that may be shared in this box from the organizers and moderators. And if you experience any technical problems, please Google Zoom Help Center or send an email to online conference at uh, IWRA.org. Well, this was this compulsory part and uh, I survived this one. So I think uh, now we can uh, start with the uh, uh, real stuff. And uh, we uh, start with our keynote uh, speaker, uh, Basant, and I'm very pleased to, to uh, have him here. When I uh, heard about project here, he was leading, uh, and when I saw what he and his colleagues uh, uh, did, uh, I, I was uh, really impressed. So this will be uh, our keynote, uh, and uh, I will just, uh, leave the floor to Basant. Basant, please, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neno, for uh, this opportunity. And uh, also, hello to everyone. And it's a great pleasure to uh, present on some work we have done in India over last uh, eight years and how 
groundwater monitoring management and the role of technology and people to work together on sustainable groundwater management and groundwater features. Next, please. So as we all know, the problem of groundwater is the levels, uh, groundwater levels are falling. So what used to be 10 to 15 meters uh, in the area where we worked, and now they have gone up to 500 meters or even more. And the water scarcity for agriculture, drinking, and industry needs, uh, they all are suffering. Next one, please. So solution to groundwater problems. So some people suggested control the groundwater use by enacting some laws or criminalize uh, if someone breaks that law. So that could be one way to control. And the second, some people suggested that we have a technical solution, such as uh, we have a pump that operates when you insert a smart card and allows you to pump out a located amount of water and the pump will stop and so we can control. But uh, my question and also my sort of insight into are the above solutions really workable in reality and are they sustainable? And what kind of technology and technical solutions will work? So these are the questions and we need to think uh, what is possible. Next one, please. So why do, why do we have groundwater problem? Uh, one is greed. So everyone wants to use as much as they want. And uh, there's a limited knowledge, it's an invisible resource and we still don't understand uh, some of the storage and the recharge and all those things. So lack of understanding what we are doing. So it is a people related problem. And so we need a people friendly technical social, social policy solutions. So we need to uh, have an integration of all these things coming together. And this is uh, what we are, we have experienced uh, that we need to do something because it's a people problem and it has people need to be put in the center. So they own the problem and they own the solution and they work with the technology. Next one, please. So I want to illustrate this through a project we have done in India. Uh, so this started in 2012 and it's uh, called MARVI, Managing Aquifer Recharge and Sustaining Groundwater Use th Through Village Level Intervention. So it's a village level, local level, and uh, working with people. So we had three key activities in this uh, uh, project, participatory data collection. So working with people, sharing this information and building understanding. So what is happening? And then engaging with policymakers, government agencies, groundwater users, and local stakeholders. So working with all these people together, that was the key sort of approach we used in this project. Next one, please. So this project involved uh, uh, nine organizations and altogether 30 researchers plus 35 pharma researchers. So we all worked together. And so it was a quite a large group and involved many. Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Could you please repeat it? So uh, involved. Uh, what would you like to send? You I'm can sorry. Ask me to send an email or send a text message. Sorry, sorry about that. This is my iPhone started speaking to myself. So uh, this was really a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, uh, we had people from uh, engineering background, agronomy, social science, economics, and so on. Next one, please. And this project was conducted in two sites, uh, one in Gujarat and one in Rajasthan. And we select, selected two watersheds and both are about 5,000 hectare in area. Next one, please. So the Marvi approach. So there's the complexity of groundwater management. So 
there is a science of groundwater, there is community, and there is government, so policy, regulation, governance. And often what happens is science works with the government or and communities uh, often works its, on its own. And so there is no connection between this. But what we did in Marvi project is we brought them together. So next one, please. So this is where we worked with the community. We developed the science that people can use or understand, and also worked at the same time with the local government, state government, and national government. Thank you. Next one. So in the Marvi project, we had four components. Uh, so researchers. And we also work with school and village communities and the local government called Gram Panchayat and state and central government agencies. And the other important component was the Bujal Jankar, which in Hindi, it means uh, groundwater informed. So we call them BJs. Next one, please. So what did we really do in the Marvi project? Train these BJs uh, and work with them on ongoing basis collected groundwater data, rainfall amount, water quality, check them water level, socioeconomic data, worked with the local schools and community groups, worked with the local government, state government agencies, and also developed tools and resources for data collection, analysis, capacity building, and connected with policymakers at the state, central government level. So it was quite ongoing process. So it was not just going um for some time and leaving things there but it was ongoing and some things we did even daily basis or weekly basis working with the farmers next one please so these bujil jankars so we had uh, engaged these local volunteers so 25 in rajasthan 10 in gujarat and they went through all the hydrogeologic concepts mapping water table measuring and water quality measuring and so on. And they became eventually local champions and interface between the research team and the community. And at the end, they felt very empowered and valued. These are the people who had only primary education. Next one, please. So they went through all sorts of field training, classroom training, mapping, and so on. And so they really became sort of local knowledge, knowledgeable people. Next one. So these are the pictures showing different field activities. So uh, working in the field in terms of understanding the geology of the area, some classroom training uh, on the bottom right side, the, this is one of the BJs uh, marking the well and so on. Next one. And we had lots of meeting with the community people uh, about uh, water issues and uh, understanding their point of view and translating what these bridges are measuring into their own understanding. Next one. And this just shows an example of uh, simple measurements these bridges did. And uh, so what uh, it shows us that uh, uh, if you work with uh, uh, even villagers who don't have a lot of training, but if they will do, they do measurements and you nurture their work and help them, they can produce data which can be used scientifically, analyze what is happening, what can be done, and so on. Next one, please. And this just shows one of the villages uh, where we measured groundwater levels for the whole season. So this just shows the you can get the trend and you can see and then local farmers can really see how much their groundwater rise that occurs before the monsoon, after the monsoon, and how it's being uh, fluctuating. So they started really visualizing what is happening to their groundwater, and they are also measuring uh, rainfall and other things. Next one, please. And this is the, we use those farmer collected data to build water balance. And again, that provided an understanding of how much recharge taking place from, say, given check team and how much uh, area can be irrigated. Next one. 
So I want to show you the simple things we have done. So this is one of the BJs and very simple is technology here. Uh, just a float and a measuring tape. And we also use groundwater sensors, but they uh, sometimes didn't work properly, but this simple technology worked. So uh, I think uh, that's one of the messages from what I want to tell. Next one, please. Also, we used uh, sh showing you the groundwater sensors, but in many cases it didn't work or it was not engaging people. But when people start measuring, they know what is happening. They start talking with other villagers. And then really the conversation shift from uh, knowing nothing to uh, telling this is what is happening. Next one, please. And also we worked with the farmers to measure rainfall. So this is one, one of the traditional rent gauges. Um, please, next one. So we use a very simple uh, rent gauge, cost about $5 and uh, UV protected and it works very well. So if you can measure the rainfall, if the villagers can measure, they start talking how much was the rainfall, what was last week, last month, last year, and that really, creates the water literacy, which we need to manage groundwater. Next one. Uh, this is weather station we install. Again, uh, it is useful, but uh, we still need the local measurements. So uh, local technology is very important. Next one. And uh, we measured the uh, check dam water level to understand what is happening in terms of recharge and so on. Next one. And we developed a app called MyWell to, because these farmers are collecting a lot of data uh, every week. So we needed something to, uh, as a repository and this app was developed to develop that sort of uh, resource. And so everyone can see and use. Next one. So this is what with the farmers. Uh, one of the BJs to some of the BJs showing how to use this app. Next one. And this is some of the screenshots of the uh, app. Next one. Next one. So I think the message I want to drive is enabling technology needs help Need to, needs to help people to work together for sustainable groundwater futures. For managing sustainable, sustainable groundwater, we need information on four aspects, groundwater levels, rainfall, water quality, and check dam water level. If we have the above information, we can understand what is happening in terms of groundwater use and recharge. And it is important to remember that we are solving the problem that was created by people and any good solution need to involve them. And, and any use of technology should work with people, not remove them from the scene and alienate them. Also, technology can be used for training and capacity building, for example, e-learning. So we are working on e-learning aspects. So for example, short videos, two, three minute video to explain certain concept or certain procedure. Online platform that uh, BJs and other stakeholders can use for self-specific, self-based learning, etc. So technology can play an important role, but uh, we need to use something that will, will work and it's a foolproof. And we are dealing with the villagers, farmers, and we need to keep them engaged. I think I will stop here, but thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Mm -hmm. And some of the publications of Marvi are available on the Marvi site. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, uh, Basant. Uh, I don't know, do we have, uh, Enrique, uh, time for one question now, uh, or would it better to proceed and... Uh, the end of the session. I think we will rather ask the questions for the whole panelist at the end of the session. Then.
Very good, very good. We have Thank taken you. notice from two very interesting questions by the moment. Oh, I, I can imagine that. I can imagine so that please because, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, let's let's do it at the, at the end. Uh, what 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 stays with me is uh, community. We have scientists, we we have governments, but actually community is uh, we do this uh, for simple technology. And at the end, technology is very important, but it's all about people. And uh, so, uh, Basan, uh, very, 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 uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will move uh, further. Uh, now we have um, uh, Rafael, uh, and he's going to tell us uh, something about use of uh, GIS and uh, remote sensing uh, for uh, acquiring uh, information on uh, groundwater use in Africa, uh, if I uh, remember correctly, because I, I read his, not only his uh, uh, paper, but also his thesis. Uh, Rafa, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nana, for that very nice presentation. Uh, so just to uh, uh, tell uh, the subject, I'm going to talk about GIS and data tools for estimating domestic self-supply groundwater use in urban Africa. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so as uh, Neno said, the results of this research are already are now published in environmental research letters uh, in case you want to uh, dig further into um, our results and method. Uh, it's an open access article. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we understand self-supply as uh, households sourcing uh, water through their own means outside the ground, uh, outside the water supply systems. Uh, and so self-supply by using groundwater for domestic use is widespread in urban sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but the extent of this practice is unknown. So the objective of our research uh, was to present a method and estimates for urban population using groundwater obtained by a self-supply uh, for the entire African continent uh, without including islands. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is a GIS-based method and we estimated maximum and likely urban population to use groundwater obtained by a self-supply. Uh, um, the uh, maximum GM uh, was uh, estimated using uh, physical characteristics of the groundwater systems, that is, uh, groundwater storage, depth to groundwater, and aquifer productivity. Uh, while like the likely part, GL, uh, was estimated considering also proximity to surface water, uh, groundwater use restriction measures, and proxies we developed, socioeconomic status, uh, and lag area of public water supply. Uh, so all of these parameters were captured uh, in um, FM, and FL, uh, these were proportions, uh, FM maximum proportion of population using an FL uh, likely proportion. And uh, to tune the model, uh, we uh, assign a range, uh, we assign ranges uh, to, the, to the likely proportion of low, average, and high. Uh, next slide, please. I won't go into details of the uh, of the method. We take uh, more time, uh, but know that each variable was uh, processed uh, to be represented in a spatially distributed grid, and uh, had some GIS uh, process to it. Uh, and yeah, GM and GL were uh, estimated through conditional algorithms using these processed grids. Uh, next slide, please. So I will explain a little bit of our proxies. So uh, one proxy to estimate where was uh, the public water supply operating within the city uh, was this one, lack area of public water supply. We use something called the lack area which assumes that uh, more recent urban developments are less likely to have uh, public water infrastructure 
and then thus the uh, residents will be more likely to depend on groundwater through self-supply. And so we um, uh, we estimated parting from uh, time-bound uh, urban uh, uh, build-up areas in the city uh, using the uh, using gathered data from the coverage from the uh, public utilities. So. Uh, based on the population living on each area, uh, time-bound area, uh, we estimated uh, for each city uh, where uh, was it most likely to be uh, still with uh, public uh, water supply and without it. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, the proxy for socioeconomic distribution, we assume that um, the low uh, income population will have more access to springs and hand dug wells, which are affected by depth to groundwater, while the medium to high income population will uh, rely more on boreholes because they can afford them, and they thus will be affected by uh, uh, aquifer productivity. And so then to, to make this distribution within the city, uh, we use the uh, uh, spatial concentration and distribution of uh, luxury amenities and uh, uh, green areas within a city. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, from, from these processes, uh, what uh, we had as results were uh, for the potential self-supply groundwater use uh, uh, for the whole continent, approximately, 79% of the total urban population could potentially use groundwater to meet their domestic needs. Uh, the areas, uh, large areas in, in Nigerian cities and in the areas near the African lakes in East Africa were the most prominent along with also the uh, Nile Delta. Uh, ne next slide, please. Um, Looking at the uh, likely uh, use, um, there was an average difference of 84% uh, between the, the potential use and the likely use. And we attribute this difference uh, to uh, the public uh, water supply being there present for people. Uh, and, and of course, also, uh, in areas where people could afford it. And then extrapolating our results of the likely use, uh, we estimate that around 32% of the urban African population are likely to use groundwater obtained by a self-supply. And uh, this compares well to earlier studies that estimated that 30% of the urban population depends on wells, boreholes, uh, or springs as their principal source of drinking water. Next slide. And so, well, uh, speaking about the limitations of this study, uh, given uh, the available data and our approach, uh, there, there were a lot of um, uh, dynamics regarding uh, self-supply uh, use of groundwater that we didn't take into account. Uh, one of them is uh, that full groundwater, water, full groundwater potential is not often used so uh, groundwater awareness uh, uh, parameter could be missing. Uh, there's also local deviations or water governance arrangements that were not captured in this simplified urban analysis. And uh, or the core of the study, the hydrogeological input uh, had a resolution of five uh, kilometers. Uh, so that's, um, yeah, that's quite large when we're talking about a city scale. Uh, next, ne next slide, please. And so uh, basically, what are the implications of our findings? Well, this paper helps us to un understand the scale and magnitude of potential and likely groundwater use in uh, urban sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, clearly, household investments are sig more significant, uh, and they should be recognized as such. 
And uh, in many urban African contexts, cells supply uh, using groundwater for domestic uh, water use is here for the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'm happy to be here. And we'll take questions apparently after uh, we're done with the session. Yes, yes, uh, Rafa, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for this uh, very uh, clear uh, presentation. And thank you also, uh, like Basan, to uh, keeping the time. So what, what we learned is actually that uh, about 80% of urban population in Africa is using groundwater, and about 30% of that is self-supply. So it is a, a, a really significant uh, uh, number and uh, uh, ask for uh, more attention, uh, certainly. Okay, great. So uh, Enrique, let's, let's move to the other one. And uh, the other one, uh, it looks very dangerous, not presenter. Uh, Christine is a very uh, uh, friendly person but the title is about policing and uh, it strikes attention it's it's a very important because we complain all the time about there is lack of compliance there is lack of uh, enforcement and how we can use technology for that and uh, christine is going to tell us uh, more about that please christine the floor is yours thanks so much i'm really pleased to um speak with you and share some of the research which is being taken place in the legal and regulatory space regarding the policing of water crime in Australia, and particularly its intersection with changing technology. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'll be having a quick look at the background to this research, some of the methods that we've been using, um, some key findings in our research so far, and the implications from a policy perspective for um, policing and managing water resources. Next slide, please. Do I look at this topic? Um, globally, non-urban water use is a complex regulatory challenge to monitor and enforce, with illegal use of water a growing regulatory challenge, only expected to get worse with climate change. This has driven regulators to have to consider new regulatory methods and technologies. And there's particularly a compelling need to explore this topic in an Australian context, where we're the driest inhabited continent on earth with some of the most variable rainfall and stream flow in the world. Next slide, please. Um, this study has been examining water policing in New South Wales, including the adoption of new metering technology and its implications for policing water crime. For those outside Australia, New South Wales is the most populous state of Australia and forms a central part of the Murray-Darling Basin, which is a catchment area covering four states. The Murray-Darling Basin has a complex history of regulation with some regulatory innovation through shared responsibility between the national government and individual states. There's also been some fairly significant controversies in recent years with allegations of water theft by particular water users and questions as to whether the, the scheme that's in place is successfully able to manage water resources in light of a changing climate. In response to some of these criticisms, governments have been rolling changes intended to improve the regulatory scheme, including a new regulator in New South Wales, the Natural Resources Access Regulator. Next slide, please. Um, this research has um, previously collected some data. Uh, so during 2012 to 2015, um, approximately 4,000 water users were approached with a 22% response rate to complete a survey. Um, the participants surveyed covered a variety of water use types, including irrigators and groundwater users for a variety of different purposes. The survey included approximately 100 questions, which asked their attitudes and views on water regulation and legislation, their interactions with regulators and their understanding of policy. Um, further research will be undertaken, uh, including 100 to 200 interviews of different stakeholders in water management, including water users, government agencies regulators and industry associations to further explore some of the preliminary findings from the surveys. 
Um, and this research is part of a broader pro project um, where we will be working with colleagues in France and the USA to broaden um, some of the research that we're able to explore. Uh, next slide, please. What's the nature of the challenge for meter monitoring and metering in New South Wales? New South Wales has had challenges in preventing water crime. In the past, there has been patchy, old and unreliable data on what water is being taken by individual users. This has allowed scope for water users to circumvent their allowed limits in the absence of accurate recording. Now, this has in turn created challenges for regulators to detect water theft or to have sufficient rigorous evidence that they would be able to then use to succeed in prosecuting water get theft. There has fortunately been some improvement in this area with requirements for new meters capable of telemetry being rolled out in a staged basis. Stage one will involve metering equipment from the 1st of December this year for surface water pumps of a certain size, and there'll be a continuing rollout until December 2023. Next slide, please. What are some of the preliminary findings from the surveys and research to date? Um, we found that improving metering and technology around water use can help regulators address the lack of data for detecting or enforcing water crime. However, in turn, from the perspective of regulated users, these developments can give rise to new concerns about things like data privacy and anxiety about regulatory reach. While there may be long-term benefits to all water users of greater data on water usage and compliance activity, there are also short-term costs in purchasing new technology. The implication of this is a need to introduce changes and undertake enforcement activities in a way that's able to build goodwill amongst water users. While there's general agreement amongst the surveyed regulated users for the need to manage water resources and to enforce compliance, changes in technology or the approach to enforcement has to be accompanied by transparent communication and education between regulators and stakeholders to avoid resistance by regulated users to that change. This is particularly relevant in New South Wales, where there's been a fairly limited relationship between regulated users and regulators in the past um, in different regions. And, and through the combination of there being both a new regulator and that history of very limited or no formal monitoring or compliance, uh, it requires um, an approach that's responsive to um, the relatively limited experience of having a compliance relationship in that way. So what are some of our preliminary implications and conclusions from this research? Firstly, the technology around monitoring and information technology can assist regulators in policing compliance in a faster and more cost-effective way. Given the historical challenges in policing and prosecuting water crimes, including due to the limited data on water usage, an increased amount and quality of data can assist in promoting good evidence-based regulation. Secondly, this technology can also encourage compliance behaviors and reduce water crime because the risks of detection and enforcement are enhanced. However, this will require communication and encouragement between the regulator and regulated users to build support for these changes. Finally, adopting baseline requirements for meters can assist in ensuring the quality of data for governments, although where appropriate flexibility should be in place for the choice of metering. Next slide, please. For interest, I'll highlight uh, an interesting outcome of the survey which was undertaken. Uh, so generally speaking, social norms can be an important influence on people's decision whether or not to comply with regulation. For example, a social norm of compliance can encourage people to adhere to those social expectations. Uh, the survey res results make it unclear um, whether this positive norm exists for New South Wales water users, as the survey results suggest that around 45% of water users surveyed were unsure whether other users were complying, and over 60% were unsure whether illegal water take was a problem or increasing in nature. These, uh, this lack of information by water users about how their peers and other people in their community are behaving may reflect that the risk of detection has historically been quite low, particularly with low population density making formal and informal monitoring quite difficult. And this points to a challenge for increasing the confidence of water users in how water is being used 
and ensuring that other water users are acting fairly. Next slide, please. What are some final takeaways for improving policing of water crime? Firstly, that metering and telemetry equipment can be used to create an intelligent compliance network, which is informed by real-time and accurate data. This should be implemented in a way which builds a broader network of compliance, including by listening to and building goodwill amongst key stakeholders, which responds flexibly and strategically to different regulated entities and adopts the most appropriate regulatory response in those circumstances. Our research suggests that regulated users in the Murray-Darling may be more influenced by peers and community leaders than using heavy-handed approaches to enforcement. Finally, um, technology can be used as a tool to overcome political, logistical, cultural resource and institutional barriers which have existed or exist to ensuring compliance. Um, so thank you everyone for listening and look forward to hearing from other speakers. Um, many thanks, uh, uh, Christine. It, it, was, it was very uh, uh, interesting presentation. So, Condense uh, and you, you provided a, a, a lot of uh, uh, information. Uh, personally, I, 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 I have uh, several questions uh, for you, but I think uh, um, I will not misuse my position as a moderator. And uh, uh, we will have a question. We will have a little bit more time at the end, uh, understood, and we will have. Uh, uh, time for questions, uh, which uh, Enrique is uh, sorting out uh, at the moment. So we are going to move uh, further and we are going to move to uh, my favorite uh, subject. And this is uh, a data information and knowledge uh, sharing and uh, especially uh, sharing spatial and temporal data as, as a combination. And uh, my colleague, uh, Claudia is uh, going to tell you something more about that. Uh, Claudia, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I am Claudia Ruz Vargas. I am a researcher at the International Groundwater Resources Assessment Center, IGRE. And my presentation is called Groundwater Data Sharing The Challenge of Spatial Temporal Data. Uh, click, please. Uh, okay, so assessment, monitoring, and management of groundwater uh, are the basis for a sustainable groundwater use, right? But these uh, three components um, really depend on data. They depend on data collection, harmonization, and aggregation, but also data share and data store, storing. Um, what kind of data they are? We have two kinds, uh, spatial temporal, uh, spatial data as um, maps uh, layers and temporal data, which are monitoring data and what the levels or and what their quality data. And ideally, all these data have to be put together in one place in an information management system. So it's not enough to just put the file somewhere, but this data has to be understood by everyone and have to be uh, so then people can combine them to produce new, pro uh, new products. For example, the map you see there, a vulnerability map made with different layers that were collected at some point by different uh, partners. Next, please. So um, countries already have uh, such systems. As you can see in this slide, we have three examples. The example from the US, from the Netherlands, and from Flanders in Belgium. These uh, platforms are very sophisticated and are able to, to put together all these data that I mentioned, so spatial and temporal. But we have to take into account that these uh, sophisticated systems made by countries are made uh, in-house, are tailor-made by the following their own necessities. But uh, these systems can be also very costly in terms of money to develop them, but also to maintain them. Uh, next one, please. At IGREG, we also wanted to provide uh, such systems for uh, countries, organizations, uh, and projects that don't have the, the capabilities to, to develop their own sophisticated system. So we have two platforms, the GTMN, which is the Global Water Monitoring Network on top in the screen, and uh, the GTIS, which is the uh, Global Water Information System. Why we have two, two separate systems? 
This is because uh, nowadays commercial software are not able to provide a, a solution that would include the two type of data together. So our two platforms are very powerful in their own field in monitoring and spatial data, but uh, you cannot really uh, yeah, get a unified system if you just uh, go for a commercial software. And if you want to develop something on top of it, these uh, developments are usually very expensive. As I said before, to create them, but also to maintain them. Next slide, please. So that's why we decided to explore uh, the another world. So outside commercial software, I'm going to open source. Uh, five years ago or 10 years ago when we developed our systems, open source software were not that advanced yet, but no, that now they are. So there is this uh, web-based platform called Geonode to, that is what's made to share uh, geospatial data. And it has been used already for several organizations. In the screen, you can see already three examples from UNESCO, from uh, ORASECOM, and from the World Food Program. And you can see that the, the software looks more or less the same. So you have different bottoms where you can put your layers, your maps created uh, with some layers, and you can organize them in, the, in a similar way. So we wanted to, to explore this. Uh, next slide, please. And that's how um, we, uh, in a project, <clears throat> the updating of the SADEC uh, GIP, Gilongwate Information Portal, we decided to use an instance of Geonode. And uh, that, that went very well. And uh, we, we saw that the main bulk of work wasn't actually to develop the architecture of a software, which is not the work of a hydrogeologist, of a groundwater specialist. But actually, uh, we were dedicated to other things, to organize the data, to, to give um, permissions, to, to set up the, the interface, to, to make it uh, suitable for the users. So, so that, was, that was also very, that was very productive for us. Uh, click, please. You can see that the structure of this uh, platform is the same because it's based in, in Geonode. So, so yeah, we don't have to spend time um, designing all of this that is not our, our job. And next slide, please. So this good experience gave us the impulse we needed to actually update our whole GGIS uh, software. The screenshots you see here are from the um, development process. So this is not online yet. And, and yeah, you can see we changed a little bit the interface and we have the same um, um, organization of the layers and maps. Uh, click, please. But yeah, this is when things get very interesting. So now that we are dealing with open source software, this is a perfect opportunity for us to combine uh, monitoring data with map data. And maybe some of you wonder, okay, what's the big deal about it? It's just data. But it's not like that. Because when you have monitoring data, you have to consider two different uh, uh, paths of work. So first, you have to be able to do the action of clicking in a point which is in a layer and call a, another file where your monitoring data is stored and do this for each uh, well in this case. Uh, you can see in the top that we were trying out this as a, as a pilot for the SADEC GIP portal. That went very well so we could actually produce the graph uh, when we click. But you have to think that also this data cannot be just like flying around. It has to be organized in a database and we spend a lot of time and now organizing a database specially dedicated to groundwater in which we can put not only the location of the well and the monitoring data, but also all kinds of metadata that are uh, especially related to groundwater. So uh, drill and construction data, hydrogeology, management data, and also groundwater quality, yield, abstraction, etc. Next slide, please. So yeah, we started with with an open source software, uh, Geonode, which is very standard where, where you can mix uh, layers to create maps. But if we combine this with other tools, click please. With other open source sources as uh, uh, Django, GeoServer, Python, uh, we put time on it and a lot of thinking, we can create a system that is a lot better. And the good part of this is that um, because these developments are made on top of an open source uh, product, 
they are also going to be open source, meaning that then anybody can use them either to create their own instance of it, or they can also use our, our system for free. And one extra point that I have to mention is that uh, working with open source doesn't mean that the data is going to be open because the user, the, the provider of the platform can always decide uh, the privacy level of the data, but it means that the, the software itself is open for use for everyone. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Claudia. That, this was uh, uh, very illuminating and uh, uh, for me, uh, a pleasure to, to hear about uh, uh, this important development. Uh, it is here about open source software, and, and that's so important. Uh, by chance, I was involved in the development of first online information system for geological survey of the Netherlands uh, <laughs> more than uh, 20 years ago. At that time, there was also a map, uh, there, there, there were time series, but that software was very costly. And uh, there's one other, uh, just a uh, uh, small thing which I would like to mention, and that is interactivity. And uh, because uh, we are developing uh, this uh, kind of software to uh, really engage uh, stakeholders uh, and uh, data owners to, uh, to share their data, to share information. As uh, Claudia said, uh, data owners, they uh, uh, define actually uh, who is going to uh, receive their data and in which form. So this is very exciting uh, development we are doing with our friends in, in South Africa, and uh, we will keep you posted. Uh, extremely important uh, for uh, groundwater in, in uh, time of uh, uh, climate change and pressure from us. Good. Uh, we are very much on time and I'm very happy about that. Uh, so we move uh, further, we move to, uh, uh, again, like Rafa, use of proxy data for something uh, completely different. And here is Lou to tell us something more about that. Please, Lou, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nano. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our work of groundwater abstraction monitoring in the North China Plain. This picture is a farmer using groundwater to irrigate winter wheat in the North China Plain. Next slide, please. Groundwater is overpumped by a huge number of small scale primitive irrigation wells in the North China Plain. This greatly complicates direct water metering. Since wells mainly run on electricity, we have the opportunity to look at energy consumption to solve the monitoring problem. Our pilot area is Guantao County in northern uh, part of the North China Plain. Annual pumping data per well is needed for comparison against water quota. And the electricity consumption of each well is metered for electricity fee collection already. Next, please. To achieve indirect abstract monitoring, key questions have to be answered specifically. First, how to convert electricity to water volume for the sake of uh, easy implementation, we use a constant conversion factor. The following question is how accurate the conversion is and whether the monitoring method is feasible and uh, sustainable. Next, please. To uh, answer the first question, we have performed intensive field tests in one district of Guantao County. The conversion factor is calculated, calculated as the ratio of measured flow rate and power input. We also installed small water, uh, smart water meters at six locations to test the direct water metering method. And they sent water volume and electricity data once per hour, thus also serve as a continuous pumping test. The figure at the bottom shows the measurements from one of the six wells. Conversion factors marked as uh, 
the green circles goes up and down with the changes in groundwater level, but generally vary within 20% of the annual average. Thus, pumping tests performed in whichever irrigation season result in a conversion with a relative error less than 20% for a single well. Um, the figure on the top, the blue dots in the um, shows that the spread of uh, conversion factor among single wells is quite large. If using a uniform conversion factor to estimate uh, sing single wells abstraction, the error can be more than 50%. Thus, we recommend to do pumping tests at each well to achieve higher accuracy. Next, please. However, in practice, it is usually not feasible to do pumping tests so intensively. Here raises the question, to estimate total groundwater abstraction in a region, at least how many wells should be tested to achieve a required accuracy? This can be solved using the theory of uh, interval in estimation. The results in this table show that on average, only one fifth of the total number of wells in a village should be tested to reach an accuracy of 20%. Uh, if higher accuracy is needed, for example, 10%, the number is tripled. Looking at a larger area, the Shoshansi district, uh, the bottom uh, uh, rows, covering six, uh, uh, 26 villages, the number of required pumping tests needs not increase. Thus, the conversion factor of a region can be derived from a small number of tests on selected wells. The resulted conversion factor is 2.6 cubic um, per kilowatt hours in Guantao County. Next, please. The final question is whether the monitoring method is sustainable. We compared the direct method with uh, um, uh, uh, we compared our indirect method with uh, direct water metering by four criteria listed in the left column regarding groundwater control. Ease of implementation and system robustness are more important than accuracy, as long as farmers are treated in an equitable way. Due the difficulty in maintenance and lack of farmers' cooperation, none of our six smart water meters still function after three-year testing period. The local water department also have similar failure experience in direct water metering. In contrast, indirect water monitoring with a pumping test within half an hour is much easier and much cheaper. Doing pumping tests only on minimum number of uh, uh, selected wells is the easiest to uh, implement. The accuracy of abstraction estimates of single well is low, thus it is weak on equitability. But it is still fair from an energy point of view, as farmers will abandon less efficient pumps and wells to avoid paying more for the same amount of water. With pumping tests at all wells, the accuracy is improved to 20%, slightly lower than direct water metering, but achieves acceptable, uh, uh, acceptable fairness. Next, please. Um, uh, in practice, the water tax generated in 2018 um, it is not sufficient to maintain a direct water metering system, but uh, it is sufficient to cover the cost of a pumping test on more than half of Guantao's wells, which means at least 18 wells per village. Next, please. Uh, we conclude that direct water metering is presently invisible in uh, the North China Plain. In contrast, the, the indirect monitoring using energy consumption as proxy is financially su sustainable and it is easier to implement. The good news is the electricity meters is being upgraded um, in Guantao County. So the um, electricity data is uh, uh, sending um, at the uh, frequency of once per day. This is the basis for uh, real-time ground, groundwater abstraction monitoring. For an individual well, the error of conversion based on field test is uh, within 20%. Uh, but this value can vary, uh, uh, can be different in other uh, regions, so it, it needs to be tested specifically. 
and field tests revealed large spread in conversion factors, but one can, one can make trade-offs between required accuracy and efforts in data collection by selecting the number of pumping tests. The methodology can be applied to other regions where wells mainly run on electricity energy, especially the intensive agriculture pumping areas in the develop, de developing country. Next, please. Um, the details of our work can be found in this paper. And uh, the, this work is part of a, a Sino-Swiss project suspended by Swiss Agency for development and cooperation. And there are another two presentations from uh, this project given by Professor Kinzerbach this afternoon and by uh, Dr. Li Yu at uh, 10 past five tomorrow afternoon. We, uh, we would like to thank all the students who assist us in the field test. And um, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, Thank you, Lou. Thank you uh, for for a very nice presentation and uh, keeping uh, the time. Uh, again, uh, uh, questions are popping uh, up, and uh, uh, we, we will uh, uh, take them uh, after one more uh, presentation. And I see Philip that he appeared. Yes, uh, <laughs> we were a bit concerned, and I'm. I'm very glad to, to see you because uh, now Philip is going to tell us uh, something uh, about the implementation of technology technology in, in wash and wash aspect we haven't uh, haven't had so far. So Philip, please, 10 minutes floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nena. Good morning, everybody. Good day, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, I'm presenting on the WASH Basins Toolkit and the accompanying WASH Connect Integrated Water Resources Management app, uh, which we have used in India, which we have developed and used in India. Um, and it's being used to help support groundwater use uh, in India, which I'm sure many of you will uh, realize is uh, uh, the main source of water in a lot of communities. Next slide, please. On this project, uh, which we are calling Wash Basins, uh, we are working with Frank Water and two India-based NGOs uh, to help to develop water resources management plans for uh, communities in two states in India, in Chhattisgarh and in Madhya Pradesh. Um, and it's a two-year project. And during that time, we have worked with the NGOs to design and implement groundwater recharge structures, um, as well as developing these long-term water resources management plans uh, which in the end have attracted funding support from the government. Uh, and coming out of that two years of work with these two NGOs uh, is the Integrated Water Resource Management Toolkit uh, and the Android mobile app, which uh, government agencies and NGOs can use. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you that may not know, WASH stands for Water, um, Sanitation and Hygiene. Uh, and um, it's the main means by which water and sanitation services are provided to um, uh, communities in developing countries. Um, so there's always a, a range of goals, um, including equitable and sustainable distribution, as well as the wash needs of women. Um, but in our project, we wanted in particular to transition to collaborative planning uh, and management by all the water related ministers in India through generating data that they can share as well as recognition amongst uh, the WASH community of IWRM as being an effective uh, approach for uh, safe and sustainable water. Next slide, please. So in essence, our project centered around three um, main processes. One is the process of data collection, uh, management and analysis. And that is both um, horizontally uh, from one community or NGO to the other or what we call vertically, which is uh, from the bottom up, from the communities uh, to the NGOs, uh, to the districts, to the states, um, and feeding into the national. These, that data then helps you to develop um, a long-term water resources plan, a water resources management plan, or water security plan, as they may be called for each community or village. 
Um, and in the long term, we, we hope that that data, and that information then becomes um, important for um, the reporting on SDG, uh, SDG 6, in particular target 6.5, which is on integrated water resource management. At the moment, India doesn't do any reporting on that. Next slide, please. So just looking at the toolkit, which is which is uh, contained within an interactive PDF uh, document that you, you can download and uh, use and share, have on your laptop, in your tablet, or you can use the um, more condensed version within the mobile app uh, the team to do the same things. Uh, we provided the flexibility uh, for people to choose whichever works best. Uh, we'll have a brief overview of what we call the six stage process, which is at the center of the toolkit. Uh, we can look at a, a couple of uh, sample stage and then some screenshots from the app as well. Next slide, please. So I don't know how clear the text is, but this, this is a, a page from the uh, interactive PDF. On the left there, you have a um, table of contents, which is uh, an interactive table of contents, which you can use to switch between the three main sections. The first one being the background on the project and WASH and IWRM and how you can use the toolkit. That is, uh, we think that's um, important for people who may be new to some of the terminology and the uh, concepts uh, to have some background reading to be able to understand and use the toolkit. For those that are already in the know, uh, the, the main section is the process, which is a six stage process, which we'll talk about. And then we also have a section on tools and workflow. Uh, and some of that workflow includes that um, concept designs uh, for, um, uh, for, for groundwater and recharge structures. Um, so providing a bit more education and uh, ways of working and considerations. But in terms of the six stages, um, once a, a community or an NGO has done their um, needs assessment, which uh, you can call uh, stage zero, you then have your first set of reconnaissance visits to understand the community and to um, understand their needs, to, to do a basic sort of survey, not a detailed one. Um, the second stage, you can then take that into that information into what we call an interim report. Um, or what in India is usually called an interim report, but it, it could be many different names. The idea is to synthesize that information to help you to start your planning. Then the third uh, stage is much more detailed field visits, which uh, many people will be familiar with. Uh, this is where you go and do your household surveys. Uh, you go and start to take measurements out to the field. You go and start to uh, visit potential locations for uh, structures to talk to the community to understand how much water is available in that environment or watershed or aquifer uh, and how much demand there might be. Um, after those series of field visits, you then synthesize that information in stage four, which is the hydrological and hydrogeological analysis. And this is where we're proposing um, some of the elements which we hope will help to um, shed more light on how groundwater is used and who is using it and um, the issues um, that they face. Um, then stage five is bringing that information together into a, a water balance assessment, looking at your supply and demand. Um, and then that feeds into stage six, which is a detailed uh, water security plan or um, water resources management plan. Next slide. So the same process is reflected in the um, app, which uh, just popped up on screen there. You still have the same six stages. Next slide, please. So we look at this one, one example of a stage, which is uh, um, where we do the groundwater and uh, surface water analysis. We structured it in such a way that um, it tells you a little bit about the purpose of that stage. So in this case, establish your hydrogeological uh, parameters that you need to collect. It tells you a little bit about the outputs. So for example, you've got hydrogeological parameters like transmissivity, hydraulic conductivity, storativity, uh, the sorts of things that uh, you normally do when collecting information in the field uh, through pump tests. Um, and what we also try and classify that information, whether it's a social, technical, environmental, economic, or, or political information. And most of this is technical and environmental. Um, we provide some tools and ways of working, uh, water quality testing kits, um, or a cheap or free analysis software. Uh, we've also 
um, developed what some survey data forms, which we've made available through the toolkit using a, a web-based software called Cobo Toolbox. Um, we talk about the data inputs that you might need from national and uh, regional data, as well as other data, data sources, uh, which you recognize, uh, geological maps, topographical maps. Next slide, please. And then the second half of each stage um, then tells you what tasks typically you'd be doing. Um, it's not a uh, it's not a sort of wish list. It's um, and it's not something that you necessarily need to um, to to follow um, their ideas. Some people will do all of these things. Some will do some. Some may be doing a lot more than this already. But this is where you have your pump tests, uh, your borehole, the deep well, lithology analysis. Um, we talk about the skills that you might need. So in terms of groundwater, of course, um, uh, trained um, hydrogeologists, or we've discovered as well with you know, NGOs, uh, you're able to impart hydrogeological skills through some training. Uh, and then on the right there, we provide a series of links where we've uh, developed um, either survey forms or monitoring spreadsheets. We've then adapted a pump test analysis uh, worksheet, which people can use for doing the analysis, uh, then links to software and resources and further information. Uh, next slide, please. So the same stages are reflected in the app, as I was saying. You can see at the to the right there, uh, stage four, which we've just seen in the uh, IPDF toolkit. Uh, so the same information is provided in the app, and that's a, a quick overview. The same links, um, and if you go into the next slide, which is my final slide. There are just some links to where you can download the toolkit, uh, get a bit more information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, you, you use uh, uh, exactly 10 minutes. <laughs> that was a uh, perfect, uh, perfect timing. And guys, I'm, I'm very, very proud of, uh, of us all because uh, we did it uh, just in, in, in time. We, we were supposed to complete presentation in uh, 915 and we did it in 915. I mean, we are hydrogeologists, we are the, the best. Okay, so uh, when, when Philip is around, before I, I give the floor to, to Enrique, um, I was just uh, thinking, you, you, you mentioned SDGs and it, it's very good that you mentioned SDGs because we, we haven't mentioned it before. Actually, Claudia has it in one of her slides. And uh, you, you mentioned 6.5. Uh, and uh, I, I was expecting also that you would, uh, talking about WASH, that you would uh, mention uh, 6.2. Uh, and that also you would talk about location of uh, sanitation facilities in uh, relation to, to uh, groundwater. Uh, yeah. Yes, no, all, all of that is, is relevant. Um, I think um, the, the work that NGOs are already, already doing water and sanitation is, as a standard, um, covers a lot of uh, 6.2 and uh, also looks at uh, sanitation facilities, both from a provision perspective, but also in terms of how they may affect groundwater. So that is already work that the NGOs we are working with already do. So what we were bringing to this project was um, the bigger picture around um, wash services in the context of the broader water resource, which is where we find that there's a gap. Um, so you often find that when NGOs go to deliver services into the village, they're looking very much at, okay, what's the potential solution here? Is it a borehole? Is it a, a, is it a, a, a well? Is it a, is it a surface water source? But there's, not as much effort put into understanding the either the watershed or the aquifer. Um, you know, what's the recharge? Who else uses water from that aquifer? So those elements around the broader water resources management, it's not their fault often because um, IWRM as it's, um, you know, laid out tends to be very sort of much about their heads. Uh, so what we were trying to do with this project was to focus in a little bit more on IWRM, uh, hence why we're looking at target 6.5, which looks at the degree of integrated water resources management. Yeah. So we were trying to bring the standard wash services together with the IWRM context. That's what Very good. this was. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for this uh, additional explanation. And I, I will go uh, now to Enrique just to ask him, uh, 
have we received the uh, uh, participants, uh, uh, presenters, any question? Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. Indeed, we have enjoyed a really exciting session in this technical kickoff. And there is one, at least one question for each of the speakers. So I don't know if we will have time enough, but uh, let's follow the order of the different slots. And definitely, and the first one is for, for Professor Maheswari. The BJ figure, the Bujal Jankars, have been the queen of the night. We have received eight different questions regarding them. And please, Professor Basant, could you please broaden a little bit the information about this figure regarding their replicability in other communities, their, their future outside the Marby project? When the project will finish, what is going on with them? The accuracy of the groundwater level monitoring from these capacitated persons, their affiliation into the community, their IT capacitation, and by last, I think the catching points and the barriers for their permanence or for their usual work. So I think if you brought in a little bit of information, it will be enough because we, don't, sure. we have time constraints, of course. Thank you. Thank you, and they are very important questions. So the idea is to engage community and uh, so they become aware and they start measuring and then uh, ultimate aim is to how to share that groundwater so we are experimenting with the village groundwater cooperatives so we have established the formally established three in rajasthan two in gujarat and uh, these cooperatives are group of uh, 15 or so farmers and about 40 hectare of land. And uh, the idea is they will monitor groundwater, they will reach us groundwater at local level and they share groundwater. So to do this, uh, they will need to employ these BJs, Bujal Jankars. So this is one way uh, they can be self-sustaining. So the cooperatives are formed and these BJs become the link or some sort of secretary to monitor groundwater levels, advise them, and so on. This is one aspect. The second aspect is uh, we are working with the national government and state government and, uh, and suggested them to make these BJs as part of the local government, the gram panchayat at the village level. So they become a resource person. The third aspect is some of the BJs in Gujarat they are selling their services to local, uh, these natural resource management projects. So they can do some monitoring and that sort of thing. And these are, remember, these are the people who have primary education or a little bit maybe middle school. But once you uh, give this training, they become very motivated and some sort of awakening happens. Okay, they can do anything because they have life experience, maybe not the university experience or some higher, higher secondary school experience. So uh, my experience, they can do anything. Uh, regarding the, uh, the, the changes that, has hap that have happened, so uh, the farmers have changed their cropping pattern, for example, their irrigation method. And uh, so from the idea of going deeper, you can find more water to understanding that there's what groundwater is limited and we what we recharge or what we get recharged is what we have. So that sort of change has occurred. Thank you very much, Professor. Anyway, I suppose any attendant could contact you by email in further yes. stages. Definitely. And the, just one more point I want to mention is now this approach has been adopted by Government of India. Uh, they want to use this in seven states of India. Uh, so from 11 villages to thousands okay. of villages. Very good. <clears throat> it's very kind of you. Thank you, Professor. So a second question for Mr. Rafael Chavez. It is, um, it is a good one. Regarding the African conditions you have exposed, how could we apply GIS for groundwater quality forecast, not for characterization? Of course, we are in the technology for groundwater resilience session. Okay, uh, so yeah, in our uh, in our research, we didn't uh, 
uh, address groundwater quality specifically, just because, uh, yeah, we realize you would need like a lot of measurements and um, yeah, a lot of analysis that was not directly within our scope, but yeah, it's definitely something that needs to be taken into account. All these people uh, drinking water of uh, unknown quality. But uh, however, I do uh, know that uh, some attempts have uh, been made to predict what groundwater quality uh, using GIS through machine learning methods, uh, specifically some uh, random forest applications. Uh, there's actually uh, a paper estimating um, nitrates, I think, for the entire African continent. Uh, uh, these uses um, predictors such as uh, farming, land use, and hydro hydrology conditions. Uh, this paper, uh, I think, uh, from it's, uh, is University of Leuven. Uh, Marnix, I think, uh, University of Leuven in Belgium. I, I, I think so. In the comments, I can answer like the author and the DOI. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it is possible. It has been done, but we have to always remember that uh, this, um, like the method will define how well or how accurate uh, our answer will be. And so, of course, we cannot fully predict, but there are attempts to do it. So um, I guess that's that's my answer. We, we didn't address it, but it has been done in, in other research. Very good. Enrique, continue. Thank you, Rafa. A third question will be for, for Christine, but our chairman, Neno Kukuric, is the one who is going to ask it. Uh, is that <laughs> because so? you mentioned before you had something wondering regarding her presentation. So oh, I have well, reserved it for you this little slot. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 you know, it, it, it's, it's a very challenging topic because it, it goes uh, about right to water, to water, it, it goes about, uh, uh, you know, water as, as a, a, a common good, as public good. Uh, it's uh, it goes uh, ab about uh, uh, social dimension, uh, ab about uh, uh, awareness, about data privacy, uh, uh, about uh, real role of technology for the community, and uh, it's it's uh, it's very difficult to 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 find a balance that uh, society as such uh, would be would be pleased. Uh, to, to uh, uh, with with a, a certain uh, solution, and uh, well, when, when I was watching uh, on, on on TV by chance uh, uh, last month, uh, there was uh, a, a nice documentary about water markets in in Australia, and uh, and I saw uh, use of technology. Uh, you, you you just uh, 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 enter your password and uh, your bank account and the via opens and water streams in. Um, so, uh, you know, it gives me uh, a, a double feeling uh, on one hand, uh, uh, wow, it's, it's so nicely regulated. Uh, on the other hand is okay, well, I, I, I need to have money uh, to, to pay this. And, uh, and uh, it's get, getting uh, extremely uh, expensive, especially in dry areas. But, um, you know, um, my question actually, actually was uh, to uh, Christine more about uh, which kind of users you're you targeting. Uh, uh, are those uh, uh, large uh, uh, agriculture uh, uh, consumers in, in a region? It, it, is it about them? Or is it about uh, also um, domestic uh, water supply uh, wells, which are not registered as a uh, all over the world? You, you mentioned about 30% of the population in the world. Thank you. Thanks for that question. And yeah, I agree with a lot of your commentary. It's a really difficult area to regulate. And um, even in the, you know, 
pretty in a country's like Australia where we have a lot of regulatory resources, there's still a lot of ways in which how we regulate water uh, needs a lot of improvement. Uh, so I think it's definitely a work in progress for a lot of countries to find that balance between social rights and economic rights and community rights. Um, in terms of your particular question, um, yeah, so the survey had been looking at a different variety of water users, so a variety in terms of the sector that they're in, um, whether they were groundwater or um, other sorts of water users like irrigated water users, um, they had a variety of sizes of their farms. Um, Australia has a fair amount of diversity in terms of farm size or farm or size of agricultural operations. So uh, I think it's important to capture all of the different types of water users, but also um, Part of the study has looked at how different types of water users answered the survey because it's also um, different size organisations, for example, had different kind of response patterns. Uh, and that information can then help regulators because, for example, the way that they may interact with a large company might differ from how they may interact with uh, a smaller uh, you know, family farm and, and having that kind of information can help them pick the best approach. Clear, yeah, clear. Thank you. Thank you uh, for, for this. And uh, sorry, guys, I was taking uh, too, too much time. Uh, and we can, I'm, I'm getting a message uh, here from the organizers that it's start, uh, the time to start uh, wrapping uh, uh, up. So we don't have time for questions uh, anymore. I see one question from Tony to Claudia, but the uh, uh, answer is yes, and Claudia is going to answer to him directly. And uh, uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, to presenters very, very much. Uh, it, it, it was really illuminating. Uh, we had uh, diversity of topics, uh, all of them very much uh, relevant to uh, uh, groundwater resilience. And uh, at the end, uh, I'm obliged to uh, uh, read the uh, 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 housekeeping instructions. And it's saying, once again, we will collect written responses from presenters to any remaining questions we have received and we'll place the answer on a conference uh, website. All I noticed that already 60 questions uh, were answered. So, Enrique, you and presenters, you're doing <clears throat> a great job. Uh, we also want to remind you uh, all that you can see an extra selection of submitted conference posters online at www.iwraonlineconference.org. These posters can be found under the poster menu. And if you have any questions on posters, you can send a, a mail online.conference. With regards to the PowerPoint presentation you have just seen, they will also be made available soon on our conference website, along with the recording of this session. Wow, everything will be there. So I would like to, uh, to Thank you all once more, and uh, we are finishing session. Thank you also, everyone. See you next time. Thank you, Enrique.